All right. So very good. So this is the the formal start of the, of the course. Thing. So, so like I said, my name is Francis Covers, and thank you guys for coming and being interested in Coleman filters. Uh, again, this the advertisement part. This is part of my course that I teach at the Unmanned Vehicle University, and this is the part of the Unmanned Ground Vehicle course. Um, so what what do we do with um, a Coleman filter? It's it's a uh, a way of getting the errors or filtering out the errors out of your sensors and figuring out from sample to sample as you're, as you're moving along what sensors you can trust and what sensors you can't. It is very good at figuring out, at removing noise out of the sensor measurements and, and filtering out and kind of averaging out the, uh, the noise in various sensors and, and giving you a good position estimate based on the best information that the vehicle has. So, um, so we want to filter out the noise in our measurements, and we're trying to do this reliably. We want to do this with a common filter. Keep in mind, this is one particular way to explain how common filters works. There are hundreds and hundreds of them out there. There are other lectures out there on the internet. There are other tutorials. Some of them are easy to under well, none of them are easy to understand. <laughs> You know, this is my particular version. You will see other versions that will explain this in other ways. There's more than one way to think about common filters. There's more than one way to explain them. However, they all work, you know, the, the same way. So there we go. So noise. So here's our, let's say this is the path of our robot as it's driving along the road. And you're going to just look for me. Um, and then this blue line here is the data that we're getting from our actual sensor. You can see that. Um, so you can see that this is our path. The black line is the path that the robot actually took. And the blue line is the data we got out of the sensors. So what we have is the basic shape of the path with a bunch of noise thrown in. So it's, you know, roughly the same shape with some plus or minus, roughly random variations in position, plus and minus. So next. So um, what if we just average this out? You know, we could just kind of average the readings from time to time and, and try to average out this, this error. And you could do that, but it's, you're going to end up with a meandering path. It's going to get rid of the bumps. It's, it, it gets rid of the jumps, too. But it's still not very useful because the worst thing it does to you is it actually slows down your sensor capability because now you're averaging readings. You're not taking one reading. You're taking 10 in order to figure out one position. And the GPS is already slow. Can you go back? Uh, it's already slow, and this is going to make it worse. So you're already, it's going to put the GPS behind the vehicle because you're averaging readings already. So next. So here's an actual, this is real data from a real GPS. I want to note this is a really bad GPS from about <laughs> 10 years ago. This is not a current GPS. But here's the point that we actually are at, the geographical point on the Earth we got of you know, it's a very simple test. Take your GPS, stick it in one spot on the ground, and just let it run for 24 hours. You'll get a plot that looks something like this. This is the, um, I guess the military is called circular error probability, CEP. But this is the distribution of error around where the, the GPS says you are, and the triangle, of course, is where you really are. So if we plotted this on a graph uh, with, um, uh, this being the zero point and, and plotting it out, you'll see that we'll get a distribution of some kind. Roughly bell-shaped curve, not to, you can see it's, it is on one side, not on the other. Uh, distribution, uh, some, and this one, in this case, all the way out to 20 meters. Like I said, this is a really bad, really bad, really early GPS. And when we, when we draw a point on this curve somewhere, if someone tells you, this is the performance of my GPS. It's a three meter GPS. It's a two meter GPS. They're telling you that this, where this probability curve hits the, either the 95% rate, it'll say 95% accurate at two, three meters, or the usual number they give you is the 50% number, <laughs> which is way over here. The published spec for most GPSs is the 50% number, <coughs> believe it or not. You would like to get the 95% number, but you've got to look in the specs and figure out what, what number they're giving you. But the average error they, when they give you is usually the 50% number. It is better. <laughs> it is. It is better. It's a better working number. Oh, that's only 2 meters. Yeah, 2 meters at 50%. Half the time it's worse than 2 meters. 
So what is that? You know, eight meters, ten meters, you know, whatever. So if we plotted this, we'll, we'll, we're going to take a more easily understood example than the previous one. We're going to plot this out on a graph. And this is a histogram. So a histogram gives you, for each measurement, it, it moves the graph up. And then we put the measurement based on the amount of error, the amount of distance from the, here's our point where the GPS really is. And then this graph shows you the error that we got out of the, uh, the GPS actual readings. So and what you'll generally see if you did a, if you, like I said, if you ran it for 24 hours, you're going to end up with a curve and you, and you plotted it out. You're going to end up with a curve that looks something like this. Um, it'll be fatter or skinnier or, well, not skinnier, it'll be fatter. Uh, and, but it'll generally have a floor, a slope, a peak, and, and be reflected on the other side. So this would be a really, really, as I said, this is a really good GPS receiver. So what we want to do, if you'll, I think, hit the next one. Yeah, thank you. Is that, so most of the time, the error range in the GPS is in this curve. It fits this curve. Mm -hmm. And what we would like to do, and so in this, this case, let's say that, that that's a normal distribution centered around four meters. Uh, and let's say for, um, what we would really like to do is to take all these measurements and throw them away because they were just bad. So go to the next line. So yeah, we would like to filter out, hence the name Kalman filter, we would like to filter out all of this error. We would like to throw it away. So if we could make a filter that could look at, this, look at our GPS readings in this manner and could figure out where on this curve the reading that we just got was, then we would be able to th figure out what readings to keep and what readings to throw away. Okay, but guess what we can't do? We're in a moving vehicle. We're in a moving robot. We can't measure our error because we're constantly moving. We don't know where the robot is. That's the whole point of putting a GPS on it. So what are we, how can we measure the error if we're moving? You know, it's easy when you're sitting still. You know it's supposed to be at the same reading over and over again. But when you're moving, how are we going to measure the errors? So let's go to the next one. So let's talk about how we estimate error on the move. So here's our real path of our unmanned vehicle, our robot, going along the ground at an equal interval. In this case, it's going in a straight line at a constant speed. So that means that this is a straight line and that these dots are e these one second intervals are evenly spaced. So and we're moving that direction uh, along the, the path. So we're driving a lot smoother this time than we did last time. So, next slide. So here's our readings we got from our GPS, our wonderful, reliable GPS. We get a pretty good reading and a sort of good reading and then something bad and something over there. And went under a bridge. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is, it's worse when you go under a bridge. Um, so here's our, our readings that we actually got. So, you know, it's not exactly following our path. So go to the next slide. So if we kind of look at what we expected the speed to be, you know, we may have a speedometer, an odometer. We may be doing wheel odometry on our vehicle. We may actually know what our speed is. If we have an accelerometer, we know that in this interval we didn't change speed because we were at a constant acceleration. So we know, we, or we can estimate from some of our other sensors what our speed and our direction should have been in these intervals. And we look at what the GPS is telling us. And it said we were at 20 miles an hour one second and 24 miles an hour the next second. We're in 30 miles an hour the second after that. And that's, you know, that, none of that agrees. So what we're seeing is, is that, let's see if we go to the next one, that these random GPS noise don't obey the laws of physics. They don't follow the acceleration and times and distance, you know, the normal uh, laws of motion that you would expect the vehicle to follow as it's driving along. You've got, you know, your uh, usual VT times one-half AT squared, you know, equation for motion. The GPS noise doesn't follow that, it doesn't follow the laws of physics, doesn't follow that equation for motion. So when things fall outside of your estimate, so you figure out, oh, this is based on my acceleration, my speed, and my direction, in a second I should be here. And you get a reading that's way the hell over there, you have a reason now to be suspicious. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use the physical motion of the vehicle 
as a filter to determine how much error we're getting from the GPS or from the IMU or from any of the other sensors. So next. So with um, this is our equation of motion, as I just said. So our new position, for, if we're going from position x to x prime, you know, this, the old x to the new x, take our old position, we add the velocity times time plus half the acceleration times, uh, times time squared. This is, our, this is where we should be. And we know also, by the way, we may, we may have commanded the vehicle to do something. We may have steered, we may have throttled, we may have added throttle, removed throttle, hit the brakes, turned the steering wheel, whatever. In these intervals, we also know that. We know what commands we have given the vehicle. So, um, so we have this kind of a, uh, motion. We might see that the, the estimate out of the, the straight line, uh, just the position estimate, might give us this kind of a, an estimate of where the vehicle should be. You know, something fair, it's going to be a lot closer, particularly in a steady state motion, than we got out of the, the GPS. So next. So to summarize, so basically we can't directly measure where the GPS, where the, the, the robot is. We have to estimate given our sensors, given our sensor data, we have to make estimates. Each of those sensors has a certain amount of accuracy and a certain amount of noise. So we can use the equations of motion to estimate where the, the vehicle, where UGV, the robot, has moved. And then we can look at our sensor readings and try to figure out which one of those make the most sense given the laws of physics. So um, then we update that. The next time we put a weighting factor on each of the sensors to figure out how much we trusted in this time, and we'll use that in the next update. And we do this cycle continuously. So we're going to update our estimate of the error and the accuracy of each sensor from step to step to step. So, and then we start all over again. That's what a Coleman filter is. That's what it does. Okay, so let's go on. So, uh, as a note, as I said, this is, uh, this is what I gave the, in my students in my class. I did not give them homework on and go do a Coleman filter and write me a program that does Coleman filtering. So this is for them, addressed to them. So let's go on. Um, so, and again, like I said, you go out to the internet and you go, Give me a tutorial on a common filter, you're going to get something that looks like this. It's, you're not going to get what I just gave you, even though what I'm showing you is exactly the same as what we just did. We've got the prior knowledge of our state, where was the vehicle before, where was the robot before. We inc increment the time step, we make an estimate on where we think the vehicle is going to be, we compare our prediction to the estimate of what the sensors are telling us, we get some inf information where our sensor is saying, hey, we think we moved five meters. And, uh, and our physical motion says, hey, you probably moved three. Uh, then we use that to update the uh, error, the estimate of error from the sensors. So we're constantly changing. We start with a certain estimate, we constantly change it. Yes, ma'am. Does this assume at one point you did have an accurate reading? No. OK. No, all it's going, that um, because it's just using the differences, mm -hmm. all we're talking about is from differences from, from point to point as we're taking samples, as we're moving, it's using that. It doesn't need an absolute at any point to, to start estimating from. Now, I will tell you, a Kalman filter takes a while to settle down. When you first kick it off, you're, it's, it develops its own versions of the error coming from the, the sensors. So um, it takes it a while to kind of get to know the sensors and get some readings and, and to converge on a solution. So it will, it will wiggle all over the place for the first 100, 150 samples, uh, which if you're running at 50, 60 hertz, that's two or three seconds. So you throw those away. You just say, OK, I'll turn it on. I'm going to ignore it for the first five seconds or first 10 seconds, and then you pick it up from there. But you will, it does take it a while to converge in on a solution. Would you ever store the values from like the last time you ran it and use those to you, yeah, start sure the can. Yeah, in fact, that's what, that sounds like a really good idea. I've never tried it, but it sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> well, what has the biggest impact to throwing you off? Is it? It's usually the bad, the GPS jumping all over the place. Uh huh. But is it is that due to the particular satellites? It's yeah, and the physics and the physics and the propagation. Mm. 
if it misses a, um, a, t a cycle or if it jumps, it'll jump from one waveform to the next waveform. And, uh, and you'll, it, that's when it does these eight meter, it's a certain uh, power of two that it will be off. Mm. And it does some other stuff. They're actually kind of wild because the, 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 uh, the other estimate they have to do is the GPS can't tell which side of the earth you're on. So it has to, <laughs> it has to kind of make an estimate of, oh, I'm on this side of the earth compared to that side of the earth. How much resiliency can be built into these filters? Uh, let's say we lose GPS contact or my cell runner decides to stop reading. Um, is it once you remove one corner of the matrix, everything kind of collapses? No, no, it it'll continue. It will throw. It will actually set the error on that on that sensor to infinity and completely ignore it. It'll throw that sensor completely away. Now the question is, do you have enough left? You know, data left of the sensors you have. You know, if you go from, from having GPS to having it fail, as I mentioned, as you're integrating along using your accelerometers, it's going to drift. And that's what you're, you're going to get that drift. A little secret on the, um, the one we use, the common filter that's in the NASCAR cars, um, we can detect when, we're, when we have a pit stop because the vehicle stops moving and the speed goes to zero. And we use that time to zero out all the common filters and zero out all the accelerometers. So at uh, the instant the car stops and the pit stops, we zero everything out in the common filter and everything out in the accelerometers and reset it all back to zero state so that when it takes off again, we're, we're canceled out all our drift. <laughs> so, okay, so on to the next one. So on to three, that was part two, this is part three. And these are bits of a bigger lecture. So yeah, three. So we're gonna get into the actual math part now. Lecture three. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go into this and start to do this. We're going to go through these step by step and piece by piece, and I'll try to go as slow as I can. All of this stuff is written down. There's a billion papers on it on the internet. Uh, just look for a tutorial on common filters. Uh, I will tell you, I've read almost all of them, or lots and lots and lots of them, and they're <laughs> way less comprehensible than this discussion is. So. Is yours online? Uh, no, it's it's part it's a part of a paid course. Uh, I actually I put this all on a DVD and I published the DVD and it's on Amazon.com. You can it's look up my name and it's called uh, Introduction to Unmanned Ground Vehicles. And uh, but I'm afraid it's about 400 bucks. But it's also 40 hours of video. So we take the entire series of lectures for the entire class for the whole semester. So um, anyway, uh, but it does have all the lectures and all the slides. Um, so again, what we're going to do is that we're going to make a projection of the state of the vehicle. So we're doing everything. This is all based on the theory of samples. We're going to take a sample, we're going to move, we're going to take another sample. So we're going to be sampling along with our vehicle either at 30 hertz, 20 hertz, 50 hertz, 60 hertz, pick a number. Um, I'm generally going to use one hertz just because it makes it easy to do the math in the example on the, on the board here. But, um, you're, you're sampling along at some fairly high frequency. Uh, in the NASCAR cars, we run, this, we run the Coleman filter at 100 hertz, because so, they're pretty fast. So are you able to get GPS data that fast? Uh, no, we don't get GPS data that fast. So I'm going to tell you how we, fix, how we, how we deal with it, because that. i got a trick for that. Um, so what we're going to do is figure out what the state is ahead. We're going to try to figure out what error we're expecting from the sensors. We call this the error covariance. We're going to try to estimate what the error is going to be. We're going to compute the common gain, which is the amount we're going to trust each of the sensors. And then we're going to update our estimate with the measurements using the weighted values of the sensor uh, information with the sensors. And then as a last step, we're going to compare the, the, what we estimated the error to be to what the error Let's see what our with the uh, let's see what the sensor said that where the vehicle was to what the Coleman filter says the vehicle was. The difference between those is the new error, and that's going to go back into this error covariance and be used in the next cycle. Does that make sense? We're going to go through it step by step. So let's go on. No, uh, this is just the is that those error updates are per sensor now. Um, yes, and, and you have your choice. Um, we, can, we can roll all the sensors together, or you can run them separately. I ran the GPS and the, and, and the I generally run the GPS and the IMU together and use the IMU and the GPS 
to balance each other. Uh, but you can do them individually. Uh, and the other bit, the other trick that makes the math much, much easier is I run the common filter three times, once for the x values, once for the y values, once for the z values. That turns my 9x9 nine nine matrices into 3x3 three three matrices, which means that individually they're much easier to work with, much easier to debug, much easier to understand. So I suggest that you do that. Do run it once for the x values, so you have x, well, we'll go through it, x, your x value, your y value, your z value, run the filter once for each of those. And uh, life will be much happier for you. Because once you get into those really huge matrices, and if you've got to debug anything, trying to debug values in a 9 by 9 matrix is a nightmare. So let's go on here. So, okay, so projecting the state ahead. So this is our first equation. When we actually write a common filter, we're going to use these exact equations. So um, we're going to use y of, y of k. This is our predicted state of the vehicle at time k. So we're at time k minus 1 in these, in, for the purposes of this illustration, this discussion. We're at time k minus 1. We're going to estimate forward to time k, which is the next time we're going to take a sample. Yeah. But you're good. So we've got um, a is our model for our equations of motion, the ones that I introduced to you earlier. Remember we had, you know, x plus uh, vt plus 1 half at squared. That's our model. That's the equations of motion that we're using. You can actually use, you can use a, one, a first order equation of motion. We're just going x plus, a, or you can use x plus velocity or x plus velocity and acceleration. Uh, when we do missile models, um, we actually go to the fourth order and use a chain, rate of change of acceleration. Jerk. Yeah, all the way, yeah, jerk, all the way up to fourth and, and some use six. If you're working with a ballistic missile defense organization, you're going to be using six, uh, and a, a model that has six terms in it. Uh, but three works for 99% of the time. So uh, uh, the uh, use going up to acceleration works really well. If you've got accelerometers, you have to anyway. So. Uh, otherwise, your accelerometer data will all get thrown away. So, of course, uh, y k minus 1 is the previous state that we got the last time. This, in other words, what we figured out the last time we ran this equation. Um, so we multiply the previous position of the, of the vehicle times the state estimate, you know, the model. This is our, and then what we add to that is our model that predicts what changes we did based on commands to the vehicle. So if we change the <coughs> throttle, if we change the steering, um, this U is a matrix that says here's the changes that I made to the vehicle, and the B is how that change, <coughs> if I turn the steering wheel, so the value of steering goes from zero to let's say plus 10, uh, you've got to have something that tells the equation, what is that going to do <coughs> with the vehicle? Well, that's going to change the lateral acceleration, or it's going to change the, uh, the delta y, or the acceleration, uh, a acceleration. You're, you're going to yaw. You're going to be accelerating in the y direction. So that's what goes in b. It's a description of, oh, if I steer, it does this. Oh, if I change the throttle, it does that. So if I change the steering, I'm yawing. I'm going to go right or left. If I change the throttle, I'm going to be accelerating in the the x direction, so if we assume the x is the direction of the vehicle, yeah, so we're going to go faster really, or slower. That's really based on the model of it's, the uh, robot thing. Correct, correct. If you're skid steering, it's a different. It's different than if you're Ackerman steering. Yeah. So that's, that's what B goes into B. Yeah. We're being a little dense here. Sure. I, I understand from your description how, <clears throat> using essentially Newton, we can predict where the vehicle is going to be and what it's doing where it should be. And how we can use that to correct the GPS, but the prediction of the Newton model has its own errors, wheel slip and so forth. And it so does. On. So that it's being corrected by the GPS at the same time, right? Uh, yes. GPS, uh, yeah, GPS doesn't care about things like wheel slip. It just tells you where you are. So it's not so just that the <coughs> equations of motion are correcting the GPS. <coughs> yeah. The GPS has also got a... a As we said, the, the, the main... A, we are a, estimating, making the estimate based on the best information we have where the vehicle should oh, be. Oh, okay. We're making an estimate. So we're going to refine, we're going to use the sensors to refine the estimate. That's what, I mean, that's. I, I, I guess I'm still confused. Is the 
is the model itself modified? In other words, so just hypothetically, let's say our GPS happens to be better than our, than right. our ground motion. Mm -hmm. so, so it's actually a more reliable system. Yes. Does it modify the coefficients for the ground model? So yes, they you'll, you'll end up, if the, if the GPS is more consistent, it will uh, give more data, be given more weight than the physics model. And the physics model is then, it's... it's the uh, physics model is just there to do the estimate of the error. It's not there to do the actual position. We're going to use the position. Uh, we'll have to look and see if A shows up in the, the when we do the position. So well, maybe it'll be more clear. Yeah. Go on. Okay, so A is really just the equations of motion. Right. All right, there's no, no sensor weight in those yet. No. All right, so that's just the equation, and, and B is just... B is just uh, yeah. like you said, what you did. So yeah. So what Y normally looks like at this point, if we're just we're just going to do X. So this will be a, a equation or a matrix with three terms. That's going to have X, the position in X, uh, V X, your velocity in X, and there, your speed you're moving in the direction of X, the vector uh, in X, and A X, the acceleration in the direction of X which is the amount that V is changing. So those three go into, that's what's in Y. That's your state, S, it's your state. So it's position, velocity, acceleration. So A is our model, that's what, where we're going to be based on strictly the equations of motion, and it's got X, because we said it's X plus, so the first term is X, the second term is uh, VT, uh, and the third term is AT squared. So that's our A. So are the so the, does it use the Actually, raw values of the sensors at this point? Uh, no, we're going to use those a little later. Okay. So okay. Well, all right. How do I? How what do I use for the acceleration term? We're going to get there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Does You're going to use. Yeah. I mean, I turn the slide. Uh, let's <laughs> let's make sure we got this. So in our so. So just to be clear, so what we've got is our state estimate, which is our, our this is our, A is our laws of motion, Y is our current position, the place, the, the state vector, the place where the, the robot is now. B is our, uh, U is our input, any input commands that we've given the vehicle to change its state. So acceleration, turning, anything like that goes into U. And B is how to apply that input, how to go from what the input is, steering, to Okay, so B, the is, state vector the B is, the, the mod, is the robot model. Yes. The acronym or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, yep. like, for example, if you're going to turn mm -hmm. in a differential robot, yes. there's a rule. Yes. You know? And so that would go in B. Mm -hmm. And U would be whether you did it or not. Now, fortunately, since it's all done in vector terms, and hang on just a second, I'll get to you. It's all done in vector terms, turning those in those Ackerman equations or the differential drive equations into vectors is actually pretty easy. Yeah. So. Yes. Uh, that first term, is that actually just y sub k? This, yeah. This is our estimate for the next update. Okay, so because it was We're a little confusing. We're projecting into the future, yeah. It's a little confusing because it, the, it's it a looks like y. It, cause it's a capital Y and it's a capital K. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's actually it's, yeah. Yeah, okay. it's hard to type for so these. It's supposed to be right. <laughs> okay. yeah, y sub k. Okay. All I can tell you is it, it was in the textbook that way. <laughs> so, okay. Thank so, you. So, yeah, this is our estimate of the next state. Yeah. I was wondering why you start with why k minus 1. Uh -huh. This is our last update. And why um, the b uk is not k minus 1 as well. Uh, because that's what we did. We're estimating the next state. So we're saying, why did we change from the last update to this update? What changed from the last update to this update? So that's why well, that's k and that's k minus one. Okay. So the assumption is that the commanded inputs at time k have not affected the robot yet. So why? why will we, have, it, we have made some change between time k minus one. We changed something in the in the controls between k minus one and k. Somewhere in between those two samples, but it, but we have was, changed something. It was a hundredth of a. Yeah, it's a hundredth of a second. A second ago, so the, the robot probably hadn't changed much in that hundredth of a second. No, Maybe a NASCAR has. That's right. But, uh, yeah, so you're saying this is what... This is what it will do. It's probably not what, what it yeah. has done yet. 
Yeah. So just to make sure. So I mean, you're dividing this all by T. So yeah. K minus one is is the actual physical or where you think the robot is. It was your last state estimate. Your last. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but it's. And that's when this. So the, those are guess, guess a lot of, Yeah, a lot of the confusing bits is, is you see that when we get to the end of this, we're going to redo that y, and when we go to the next, come back and do the loop again, our this is going to become that. And we're going to be using our best estimate that we've fixed and we've tweaked and we've updated and we're going to use that for the next iteration, which is where all the, am I taking the sensor readings, am I taking the laws of physics, you know, that's where that all goes into the status. It all circles around itself and comes back to the beginning. Yeah. Um, just to sort of follow up on this question, mm -hmm. um, is this an initiation state? Like, um, is this when, let's say, switch? No, the this is this is where this is the first step in a loop, an iterative loop. There is some setup prior to this, and I'm trying to give you enough information to let you know. And we'll, we're going to go into some detail here in a minute. How to get how to run this through the first time. So the first time, this you'll have some initial position estimate, and sometimes you can set it and you know what it is, or sometimes you have to let the GPS figure it out. Um, You'll have some initial position to start with, and some initial. Hopefully, your initial velocity is zero. Your initial acceleration is zero. You have no commands. It's sitting there, not moving, and you can start with that. Um, all right. So let's go. On. So, and by the way, if you don't, you don't have to use the B and the U part. If you don't have those, the capability to know those, and you don't have them, you don't use them. I, in the NASCAR, I, I don't have any control over the driver, so we don't know what inputs he put in, and we don't have those in the equation because our sensors aren't good enough to, to put that into the, uh, into the box. So uh, we, do, we didn't use that, and if you don't, it's fine. You just use the A term and throw away the B term, so you don't have to use it. It does make your estimate better. Okay, so now we're what well, we want to do is we want to predict how much noise is going to be in the measurements. When we get around to taking the measurements, we want to estimate how much noise is going to be there when we do. So we're going to predict the error in our measurement, or we're going to predict the error, error covariance. Covariance is a fancy term. It's a mathematical description of that curve. Remember we said here's the curve or what the error looks like? It looks like a bell-shaped curve or it looks like it's got a step in it. Uh, whatever that curve is, the covariance is a mathematical description of that curve. That's all it is. It's, it's uh, uh, three terms that draws that curve for the, for the, for the equation. So, um, so going through this again, A is our, the same as it was before. It's our model of motion. P was our previous error value at time k minus 1 that we had last time. That, we, that the model it creates this each time it goes through. Uh, AT is the, uh, this model transposed, and all we're doing with this is turning, this is, starts off as a three by one matrix, and we're gonna turn it into a three by three so that we can do some work with it later on. So when you see this A and A transposed, which is what that T means, uh, which is taking the, the one, two, three matrix and making it a, a row, taking a column matrix and making a row matrix out of it. Uh, and when you multiply those two together, you get a three by three. So that lets us do some other, it's a math thing to <laughs> make the uh, matrices behave properly. Um, and then Q is the covariance of our error noise, which does, again describes the distribution of the noise. So the question is, since it's going to figure these out later, what the hell do we put in these uh, to start with? Um, the trick that I've had that works is in Q is I have been putting in as a starting value the standard distribution of the noise of the sensor given to me by the manufacturer. So I'll say that again. It's the standard distribution of the noise from the manufacturer of the sensor. So the GPS is going to give you a value, the accelerometer is going to give you a value of what the noise was measured and it's a good place to start. You take the standard deviation of that. So um, that gives it uh, some initial curve to start with, because it's as I said, this covariance is a description of what that curve looks like. And so you're saying, oh, it's roughly a bell-shaped curve, and it's roughly this big to start with. It's going to update that estimate, so you don't. Have to, you just got to give it, get it in the neighborhood to get it started. 
If you pick a value that's too big or too small, your model is never going to converge. So when you see this where it goes wandering off, uh, you've picked a, a value that's wrong and you have to try some other values. And sometimes you just got to fiddle with it until it works. Um, now, once you fiddle it with it for a set, given set of sensors, mm -hmm. you usually don't have to mess with it anymore. No, no. Once you got a value that works, it's gonna it'll converge on you and it'll, <coughs> and it'll behave. So that, that's where you would uh, use the idea of whatever your last value was but before yes. you shut it off. Use it again. Yeah, you'd have a persistent variable that you could use reuse. You would put it here and you would put it there. So let's go on. Okay, so now the fun part. This is the, ma the kind of the magic term. This is the common gain or the amount that I'm going to trust this particular sensor in making my S in making my position estimate. So, um, and it's as you may notice. I mean, as as fancy as this math seems to be, this is basically just a bunch of multiplies and divides with matrices instead of with straight numbers. But it's still just a bunch of multiplies and divides. So um, we're going to start with, uh, this is our, K is going to be our, our gain, that's how much we trust this sensor. Uh, PK, as before, was our predicted aerial covariance, it's the one from the last run of the model. Um, uh, H is uh, how the sensor readings reflect the vehicle state. Okay, so we're going to do the exact same thing with the sensor readings that we did with the command inputs. Remember when we did the commandment inputs, I said you had to have a model that told it how this particular command affects the vehicle in terms of the state, in terms of X, Y, and Z. You have to do the same thing with the sensors. Uh, you have to have a model that say, how do I get from my sensor reading, I get, I have an, for example, it's really it's simple with an accelerometer, that goes straight into the acceleration term of the state vector. You put it right into, you have 0, 0, 1 is the model. Uh, which means just take the acceleration term and put it there. Um, the uh, uh, other other um, sensors may do other things. So the, if you've got a roll sensor, the the uh, uh, gyroscopes that are detecting uh, roll, then you've got to come up with how does that affect my x, y, and z. Um, and frankly, the, it doesn't except for the yaw. Uh, the other two, you, you kind of, you don't, you, if you're driving a ground vehicle, in, in the air, you've got a, a fixed off, a six degree of freedom solution. On the ground, we're only using uh, two degrees of freedom uh, since we're stuck to the ground. So, uh, unless you're balancing. Unless, unless you're balancing like yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, you're, fly, you're basically flying above the ground, so. So you need all of them, but uh, for, for ground vehicles, it's nice because the only one you need out of the, out of the uh, roll sensors is yaw out of the, the gyroscope, excuse me, the gyroscope. The only one that works, that affects the equations of your position is yaw. Uh, you know, bouncing up and down doesn't affect the position of the vehicle. So, uh, so again, H is this model of how the sensor readings are, and then, um, we got H. There's yeah, where there's H, okay. Where you would need the three, three gyros of it if you had a magnetometer, yeah. right? Because right. then you, then, Depending on the incline, mm -hmm. it, it actually does change the reading yes. off the magnetometer. Yeah, and and um, the magnetometer goes into um, well, all it gives you is heading. So you've got to turn that into how does the heading affect my vector? Uh, so it ends up being a, a vx or a vy. Same thing with the three axis magnetometer as well. Mm -hmm. That's what we're saying. That's, that was the question. What does the magnetometer do? Well, I mean, because you've got for the, mag for the three axis magnetometers, we've got yeah orientation to the Field right. Five. So basically, all I can tell you is if you've got again, if you've got, okay. and you've got to turn that into into how how does that change my my state vector from the previous time? So we turn it into x, y, and z terms. Uh, and finally, R is our error in our sensor. So we're going to be adding our sensor readings into our you know equations of motion. So we need some description of the error from the sensor. And again, this is you take generally the standard deviation of the error from the sensors uh, to start with. That's a good starting value for that. So, um, let's go on. Okay, so now we're going to update our estimate with our measurements from the sensor. This is where we're going to bring the sensor readings in, our GPS and our IMU, and we're going to plug it into the position. So, um, this 
YK with the hat on it is going to be our estimate that we're going to actually use for navigation. So this is the, the result of the Coleman filter. This is the output of the Coleman filter. Uh, which is kind of interesting is we're actually still kind of in the middle. We've got several steps to go yet. But here in the middle we've got the new state estimate. This is our best Coleman filter, filtered out estimate of where the vehicle is. We're going to take the one that we did last time and we're going to add basically our sensor readings plus the um, yeah, and the gain, exactly, to tell us how much we're going to trust that particular sensor. So Z here, Z sub K, is our measurements that we got from the sensor. Remember, H is our model of how those sensor readings affect the vehicle. Um, and we're going to multiply that times our previous state estimate to give to say this is how much we think the vehicle changed and, and this is how much to trust it. So we're going to weight the value that we're getting from the sensor. And then we're going to add it to our previous state to say here's the new state. So that's actually pretty simple and straightforward. <laughs> so old state plus the common filter gain times the sensor reading, how much the sensor reading is telling us, and then how much we can trust that sensor. So this is the weighted value. So, and these got, uh, um, this K got computed in the previous step. All right, next. Okay, so the final thing we're going to do is we're going to update the, the error covariance. Uh, and this first bit here is the actual equation. So we're going to now going to re-estimate our state so that we can run. The, this is the last step before we go back, loop back up to the top and start this process all over again for the next step. So we've got uh, PK is our new error covariance. Again, is a description of the Gaussian curve of the noise. I is an identity matrix. It's literally the number one. It's, it would be one if this wasn't a matrix equation. It's the, it's the identity matrix. One, one, zero, you know, one, one, one. Uh, it's a three by three at this point. Uh, K is the common gain that we computed. H is the measurement model that we used previously. P sub K is the previous estimate of the error. So all we're doing is just multiplying those. One minus the common gain and then the previous error. So we're updating the, uh, our estimate of the error. Um, and uh, let's look at the next, next slide, and that was pretty much it. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's how a common filter works. Uh, and I know that it's, it looks hideously complicated. Uh, and it, to tell you the truth, in computational terms, it's a whole bunch of additions and multiplications. A few, well, usually you're dividing by one over We'll multiply by one over something, so it's you know, a few divisions and, and stuff, but it's mostly multiplication. Uh, it's, uh, I've done it dozens of times. The, the one that runs in the NASCAR is running on a computer that's literally that big. It's called a gum stick. It's a tiny little arm computer. You're floating, that you floating point? Or you it's got point? floating point, thank goodness. You, you do I have done it, I've done it in fixed point computers, but it's, you, you have to kind of... It's ugly. <laughs> it's ugly. Yeah, you gotta kind of be willing to take a little more error. But uh, the arm actually has the the gum stick has a floating point processor, coprocessor. So it actually worked really, really well. I was tickled with the result. We ran the first iteration. We turned a box that was my my job when I came in to help with NASCAR was the previous box that was doing the the stuff you see on television weighed 30 pounds and it was this big, it was so 18 inches by 11 inches by 4 inches deep and it had active cooling, it had an actual cooling duct uh, coming from the car, which if you're a NASCAR designer, you're going, I have to have a 4 inch cooling duct for what? You know, so I can be on TV? So, um, and this box actually does a bunch of functions, it doesn't just track the cars, it also t tells there's a tracking system that uh, replays the entire race in 3D. You can buy a product called RaceView where you can watch the race at home and see where all 40 cars are on the track all the time. And then see, watch the race from any car you want to. That's run by that system. Uh, there's a system that points it, uh, tells the director which, which car <coughs> he's got the camera pointed at. Uh, pointer function, you'll see that occasionally on TV where there's a pointer going, there's Matt Kinsley's car. Uh, that, uh, that is also run from this box. Uh, and the um, uh, they're also doing the, the timing you see when they say, oh, that pit, second was four, pit stop was 4.3 seconds long or 9.8 seconds long. That's, the box also does that. The accelerometers in the box can actually see the jacks going up and the jacks going down. 
Uh, so we measure that time. Because the vehicle stops and then the jack, and the jacks up and then it jacks down. So we, we can see those events on the accelerometer trace. Uh, so anyway, um, so one bit about Kalman filters, and you'll hear this from anybody who works with Kalman filters, is that it is very hard to figure out what the covariance matrix is supposed to be. And this again is my bit. It's, you have to do some trial and error fitting of it. But <coughs> again, as I mentioned, uh, it does take a bit to settle down. So you'll need a few uh, iterations, 20 or so, 20 to 100, depending on how fast your loop is for, this, for the system to settle down. So if you if you're let's say you're uh, I'm, I'm interested in robot uh, what is it robot Magellan mm -hmm. and you know that course is you got different cones in different locations yeah. you gotta go find them and touch them right and but usually you know the cones are way off it's not like they're 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 a hundred yards away right so you know your first hundred yards if you put your robot on the ground, it would be run straight for a while. That would work fine for the tuning. You wouldn't really worry about it. No, you would. And frankly, you can just sit still for three seconds. You can just sit there. You can just sit still, yeah. It doesn't have to be moving. Okay. So you can throw it out. Uh, uh, I've only had problems with this when we were starting, when I was doing a run, and, and it was in the middle of a... We would start the, the race car stuff, and it'd be in the middle of a lap. And I would start running the common filter on, on a car that was in motion. And uh, we get this wild swings. We get this big oscillation to go on for about 20, 30 samples, and then it would settle down. Did you repeat that? Hmm? It's hard to ask you to repeat that. Oh, I'm just saying the the first 20 or 30 iterations are up to 100 uh, of the common filter are going to be wildly off. So it takes it a while to settle down. It's got to learn the sensors. It's got to learn the error from the sensors, and it will settle down. The better you've done an estimate of your error in advance the better it all will work. Again, I think that's a really good idea to store that from run to run because uh, it does compute it for itself. It, you do, it, it self updates. How about, Cal, you know, the type of sensors we're using, a lot of them, mm -hmm. you know, you, like for example, you couldn't really expect your magnetometer to be correct from previous time. No. Uh, in fact, I mean, you're really going to have to. No, and this doesn't do anything to, to fix uh, drift in your accelerometers either. Yeah. So, um, so if I tune them, it shouldn't really mm -hmm. make that much difference. Otherwise, you know, I have to do the calibration mm -hmm. rotations and all of this stuff, put yeah. the sensor down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But I'm, I'm thinking if, let's say the initial state of the sensor, um, there's the area, that, uh, the error margin that you're picking up from the manufacturer data sheet. Right. If you calibrate your covariance matrix mm -hmm. using that using your resolved error it's you the initial that. values that you put in at the start yeah and yeah. then that becomes more accurate because you've yes. run through it a few mm -hmm. times so then you can store that and correct and, and reuse that. it yeah that's that makes perfect sense yeah. and I, that's that's uh, completely legitimate yeah so the uh, the factors in here tell us how much we trust a sensor mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering, in robots, we often use the wheel diameter for odometry. Uh -huh. And suppose that's off. Right. So we've got a, you know, a constant amount of error. Um, is it just going to tell us we don't trust that sensor, or is there any way to look back at the numbers and kind of reverse calibrate to, to figure out that? Yeah, the common filter will not fix that a problem for okay. you. It will, over time, it will learn that it can't trust the odometers, uh, odometry, and it will stop using it. Uh, in the line, we've had the GPS go out, and, and after about six or seven samples, the, the common filter kind of, the error goes to infinity, basically. And it just starts throwing the, the, it ignores the GPS. Now, the nice thing is, is when the GPS comes back in and it starts fitting back onto the curve, uh, fitting back onto It'll the motion curve, it, it will pick it back up. So as we said, if you drive under a bridge, you know, you'll lose the GPS for a few seconds, and then when it picks back up, the common filter will put it back in. But if you had stored all the data, you could look back and see mm -hmm. where it's basically ignoring sensors. Yes. Yeah, you can look at the common gain over time, and you'll see it go, it'll go to zero as it trusts the sensor, and, and I think it goes to one as it... The, or, I'm sorry, it goes to infinity when it doesn't trust the sensor. 
and you you can graph that out and say, oh wow, I lost I lost my accelerometers halfway through this run or something. So that's what the identity matrix is. It's a one minus that yes. value to give. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're subtracting that value from one. Okay. Francis, on on the case where he was talking about where your odometer, <coughs> let's say every time you let's say one wheel you thought it was a foot. I know that's mm -hmm. just a foot sure. number, but and but it was actually a foot and a half. Mm -hmm. All right. He wouldn't necessarily throw his sensor away if he had a consistent error. It would, it would just essentially say, hmm, I don't trust this guy that much. And so it doesn't attempt to scale it to a right value? No. Okay. That's, that's so it would literally does. just say... Yeah, common filter just tells you, based on the estimate of the error, can I trust this sensor enough to use it? How much can I trust the values coming from this okay. sensor? So, so, so a it's systematic more waiting, error... Trusting type so it's of thing. And it does take it several samples. It's not instant. It, oh, yeah. It's 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 uh, accumulating error over time. So, so. let's say uh, you have a situation where you have wheel slip. Is this like going under the bridge? Otherwise, you know, you, yeah, you finish, you and all of a sudden you're not slipping anymore. Right. Would it uh, start? Yeah, the Carlin filter will start dialing it out of the solution. It'll mm -hmm. trust it less and less and use it less and less. And then as it comes back in and it starts fitting back, like I said, fitting back into the model. It will start bringing it back up, back in. Okay. So, but it'll dial it out. If sensor stops working, it'll dial it out. Okay. Yeah. What about? Um, okay, I'm going to slide back to the five steps. Sure. Where, do you remember where that was? Uh, Is that like, that's like the first, the second, or third slide? Yeah. Okay. So I guess I'll yeah. we'll see what else. Okay. Do you want to go into another? Okay. Uh, well, we're going to cover. Uh, we'll see what else. This, this is the, this is it, right? That's, yeah. Here's it in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah. Oops. <laughs> you just sit. Okay. okay. So this yeah. is mm -hmm. so this is all of them together. This is yes. the big. Yeah, yeah. This is the loop. Okay. So start here. One, two. Yeah. So we're going to predict, two. and then we're going to correct. Okay. Yeah. And it's it's the concept. And as I said, the bit is is that how do you measure error on the move? And that's. 90% of what's going on here is this part is trying to figure out how much error I've got based on my estimate of where I should be based on my previous data. And it's using, I mean, this, this uh, when it's projecting the state ahead, it's using the previous estimate, not just the, the raw physics model, but it's using what it, the physics model it's best plus guess. The, yeah, its best guess based on the sensors and based on the readings. I mean, you know, certainly it can only, you know, it's, it's always a case of, if it's all trash, if all the sensor reading is trash and, and it doesn't have a good estimate of velocity and stuff like that, it's Probably not going to work very well. On the bright, yeah, exactly. If you've got bad data, it's you, there's not much you can do with it. On the bright side, though, if you've got noisy, the thing this is really good at is if you have noisy data that's got random variations in it, it will filter out those random variations. So that's what it does. I mean, that's yeah. How about drift? Will it? it will not. It will not so, fix drift. You know, it will dial the sensor out. But it won't fix the drift. That's why I said, well, on the race cars, we had to cancel the drift out. Every time we came into a pit stop, we canceled out all the, all the drift. Okay. We zeroed out all the accelerometers because so we, we had drift. Yeah. So the you know, accelerometers you're integrating and the drift. You're integrating and you're going to get errors, and, and the error is going to add up <coughs> over time. That's drift, exactly. And, and even the gyroscopes drift a bit, too. They'll, yeah. they'll have the sensor drift. They'll, have, they'll actually go off their, um, they'll show you in a turn where there's no turn. Uh, Do you have any time. sense? Okay. So on. So uh, if, let's say I start to lose my accelerometer, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that's drift. Yeah. Okay. Can I? My robot can stop and then zero everything. Yes. And then restart again. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, this is cool because it tells me when my drift gets so bad that it's. Did it's, you can't trust it anymore. Can't right. trust it anymore. That's right. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, you could that's be cool monitoring your calm and gain. Yeah, the calm yeah. and gain on that. Cool accelerometer. before you said that. That's yeah. even yeah. cooler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> monitoring that value, and when it gets to above a certain level, to say, okay, it's time to stop and zero everything out. Because usually, in, usually, yeah. in most of the competitions, you wouldn't be penalized too much for stopping. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, no, no, sometimes it just happens. How, how much drift did you get in your accelerometer? Just, just. Uh, they, we, they were fairly cheap, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, a fair amount. Um, we, well, the problem is not, as he said, it's not actual drift, it's, it's uh, integration error. 
Yeah. We're, yeah. we're well, tiny little errors build up yeah. over time. Yeah. Yeah. So over time, it's an, uh, yeah. it's an yeah. offset, so to speak, that gets integrated. Yeah. The, ne the neat thing, oh, well, one good thing about integrating is that it does tend to cancel the noise out on its own because you get the noise is plus and minus roughly the same amount. So it does tend to cancel the noise out. But uh, the bad news is, is that any tiny error creeps in over time. And, and some of your error may be just in you quite don't have quite the math right, or you don't quite have your constants right. You know, those can also well, your model is never going to be perfect. No, it's you never said you can perfect. add terms, you can keep adding terms. It's still you can, it's be, never going to be, yeah. you know, you can get better and better. Yeah, that's why, as I said, we went to some, we were using six, six terms. And you know, those robo Magellan kind of tests, mm -hmm. robot three is going to do it, yeah. If it runs for a long time, it, it might run for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Now for That's Gerber a long challenge, time. we use three, we use three terms. Yeah, and I just don't think you're you going to get any drift worth thinking about in no. 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, you will in your your um, gyroscopes will drift that. They'll drift over for over two or three minutes. I think that's the question he was asking. Now that's where the actually the magnetometers come in handy because you can cancel out the drift in the gyroscopes using the magnetometer because magnetometers don't drift. Yeah. So just a curiosity <coughs> question on the on the race car. To just show the speed on the screen isn't just the odometry enough for that, or oh, we actually use the GPS for that. We don't have a wheel odometer on this on the race cars. We're using hmm. the GPS for speed. How do you do your estimate of the next uh, error? Oh, uh, okay. You want to know how what we did for uh, uh, basically we we call it coasting. So I'm taking samples. The GPS we have in the race cars is a 20 hertz GPS. It's a 2,000 something, 2,200 dollar GPS uh, made by uh, Novatel. Um, but it gives us 20 hertz samples. Most GPSs have, are these days are five, yeah. and the old ones were one. I mean, back when I first started, when we did DARPA Grand Challenge, the best one we could get was a one hertz GPS. So, so, so what we do is is coasting, and that's we take the same equation of motion that you just saw. And we take our last estimate of the, the GPS position and we coast it based on the, vec the state vector, the, the velocity and acceleration of the vehicle. And basically, we're filling in the dots in between. So you have no BU? No BU? You have no estimate of the changes that have been... Uh, we, uh, with command, that's, uh, that's a good question. That should be added in there. Uh, but you can actually use that. We use that same technique to... to to estimate, the, to basically, we're taking two GPS readings and we're drawing a bunch of dots between them. So we're interpolating between the GPS positions. Interpol well, it's extrapolating because you're doing it forward. Right, right. And you set on. But we call it coasting because you're using the the previous state vector to keep the GPS to make make up samples for the GPS. And you said on screen it says what gear they're in. Do you figure that out, or is there? No, a that's in the CAN bus. We're connected to the CAN bus in the car, so we can see mm -hmm. the throttle, the steering, the steering oh. position. There's actually a steering position sensor, um, which is a potentiometer with a piece of string wrapped around the steering wheel, uh, <laughs> steering column, and uh, uh, there is a position sensor on the uh, throttle. So we get those all off the CAN bus. So it, does, so it does. Make, so when you're coasting, mm -hmm. like you're saying. This. Yeah, we're making it. You're interpolating readings so it's, between it's the two, between the, the GPS. It's getting a couple and getting two. Yeah. And so yeah, we, if your coasting assumption is wrong, yeah, do the wild turn to the left. When you get the next GPS reading, it's going to fix it. But you may have you may but, have a jump in your. But I'm saying in the yeah. five. Let's say you're doing five. So that means, yeah. and let's say you're sampling at twenty. Mm -hmm. So you got fifteen reads between there. Yes. Yeah. Just guess. Mm -hmm. And so, but what I'm saying, if something happens in that 15 read, basically your GPS sensor is going to be discounted. Mm -hmm. So it'll be, it'll be it'll be there as long as it's making sense. Yes. So as long as your coast and your extrapolation seems to make sense. <laughs> yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we use. I mean, if you've got 100, we could read the accelerometers at 100 hertz. Yeah. 100 times per second. So that helps. Uh, uh, but we do coast the GPS in between to do a 100 hertz position estimate. So, so that's just five samples you're making up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which just doesn't sound that bad. Yeah. How did you uh, protect your sensors from vibration? Um, to tell you the truth, for this version of it, uh, previously we used rubber isolators. The mm -hmm. new one, well, the new one's on shock, rubber shock mounts, okay. but it's mounted in the ceiling. Uh, where frankly, we're using the common filter to filter out the noise mm -hmm. caused by the so, vibration. So, but it, it doesn't help your accelerometer. It doesn't help. 
It does help. Mostly it's up and down. Most of our, 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 our the vibration of the car, you can, I wish I, I had some actual data I could show you because I've got gigabytes of data from actual race cars. Mm -hmm. uh, most of your noise is in the vertical direction mm -hmm. of the car is bouncing up and down. Uh, so it, uh, it uh, fortunately doesn't affect the position that much. So it used to be, it used to pull the, if they, the previous version, it would pull the car up off, the car would float off the racetrack after a while. <laughs> Do you use those numbers for anything else? We now clamp it to the, uh, yeah. huh? Do you use those numbers for anything else? That is, you, you can tell now the difference between the, the sensors, the error between the sensors, which might yes. be useful information. It is very useful information. Yeah, you can, like I said, we're coming up with our own estimate. The common filter figures out for itself. The problem is that that number, you can't look at a co covariance is not a human readable number. When you look at it, and it's, um, it's, it's a set of coefficients that go in an equation. It's, they're not numbers in and of themselves. They don't make sense. Uh, if it's a third order, equa order equation, it's something, you know, x squared plus y squared plus z. Um, it's those coefficients that are in that value. So it's not, you can't look at it and make any sense of a covariance. Let me give you an example. One of my robots, yeah. <coughs> when it gets stuck yeah. uh, in its differential drive, it's typically trying to rotate in mm -hmm. order to get free. And it's got essentially, it's got a little IMU on it, but just ignore yeah. that for a moment. So there's mm -hmm. a gyroscope there yeah. telling you how much the robot is really rotating. And there is a wheel odometry telling you how much it thinks it's rotating, which would be wrong because it's stuck. So yeah. the difference between those two is an error signal. And you can say, oh, I'm in an error condition because those two, yes. they Don't should be close. Mm -hmm. As long as they're close, we're OK because they're yeah. drifting around. But if they're way off, then, you know you're stuck. then there's something about uh, the position of the robot that, that needs attention. I was wondering if you can use those. Uh, not, in the, not for a common filter. It's certainly usable. But uh, um, I think the common, you would, like I said, if you watch the common gain for that sensor, uh, you will see it spike as it, gets, as it goes to away from the physics model. Uh, the common gain will go, will start to rise, or start to fall. So I'm trying to think of which use, way it goes. It, <coughs> goes for, it, it drives for <coughs> zero. As it moves toward infinity, there's something yeah. to be noticed. I don't know which way it actually goes. We have to look at the it multiplies. It's K We're multiplying time, it. So it's, it's yeah. Zero so it's would zero. Be. When it's bad, it's zero. When it's good, it's one. Okay. So it is. Uh, I was thinking it was a range from one to zero. So when it's at zero, the sensor the sensors completely fail. When it's at one, it's completely trustworthy. <coughs> yeah. The the common filter is not magic. It's just simply the best tool for dealing with noisy sensors that we have. No, it's yeah, magic. it is. A, yeah, it is that. Well, and then, yeah, right. I, the the stuff we got out of the race car was just flipping amazing. The I could tell you within two inches where the cars were on the racetrack because we had this super sensitive GPS on board. Uh, it's a survey quality GPS system, so we had a two inch error on the position of the car on the track, and then we had the common filter making that better. So I, we could watch the exact spot where the, the race car driver went around a corner and tell you exactly where he, and it was amazing to watch, I, I watched one guy through a 200 lap race and he was probably within a box 12 inches wide on his wheel going around say corner number two, he would be within that far of the apex every single lap. The teams must love that. Oh yeah, well they don't get to see it unfortunately. They don't? No, they don't. It's cheating. We have a lot of problems with people trying to steal our data out of those boxes. Why is it NASCAR, made available to you? is not for permitted me? in NASCAR. Uh -huh. So for anybody. And we have the only telemetry. So uh, <laughs> so, uh, so like the, the TV, who, who controls the telemetry? Is that the sponsor uh, it who It belongs to NASCAR. The rest? It is yeah. paid for by the spot by uh, ESPN actually wrote the check to us. Mm -hmm. And then ESPN, of course, got gets money through sponsorships. So Sprint or Verizon or whoever the, it was generally Sprint. Uh, but it's just they, for that was their, actually paying the bills. It's just for their television use. Yeah, basically. and uh, the company I work for, Sport Vision, when we went to a race, we took a 18 wheeler and a 10 man crew. So we put uh, it was quite a production to put this all together. We had our own production van. Uh, we did most of the all of the numbers that you see that are on the screen come out of that van come from Sport Vision. So we did every number that you saw up on the screen during the whole race. There's so much money in that. They're bound to use telemetry when they're training. 
Uh, oh, they, they do, yeah. With they the, they take it off on the racetrack. Yeah. And it's the opposite when you go to Formula One or you go to IndyCar. IndyCar's got nine antennas. Is that right? Nine <laughs> one-tree antennas on it. Cool. And ours is just one of them. Uh, Formula One's probably got 23 antennas. So they've got, <laughs> they've got an amazing, you know, they're, they've got everything on there. You know, they've got strain gauges on the A-frames and, and, you know, temperature, ga temperature on the tires and temperature on the, uh, on the brakes. And Heartbeat so on, so and blood there. pressure. Yeah, there's something like 20,000 data points on it. You know, so they're <laughs> cool. It's amazing. Francis, um, do you uh, have any, you know, one of the things that we talked about earlier was, was the possibility of, uh, is there a, some software or something that, or some place that you might say you would suggest we just take a start look, start looking at? I'm sure there is. Let me see if I can't find an open source. There are several open source source common filter yeah. software out there. Yeah. Um, yeah you know, I, it, I, I will let you in on one of my personal secrets. Um, I use Python in my embedded systems. <laughs> Python does matrices okay. natively, which means you put instead of you say k times t equal y. Exactly. And t transpose. It'll do transpose. It'll do. Now, the one bit is, is that their matrix multiply function is wrong. And they know it's wrong, and they haven't fixed it. And it's still wrong. So um, <laughs> you have to write your own matrix multiply function. Fortunately, that's not very hard. It's just that it, going, going through two loops real quick. So, um, but um, <coughs> don't use the matrix multiply. Everything else works. All the matrix adds, all the matrix divides, all that all work. Just not matrix multiply uh, for, uh, on Python. That makes it a hundred times simpler. Doing it in C, you've got to take the matrices and pull them apart, which means first of all, you can't use dynamic matrices. They've all got to be. You've got to know in advance how big they're going to be. In Python, you don't. Uh, and you've got to unroll. Basically, it's like unrolling a loop. You've had to unroll a loop before. In in uh, C plus plus, you got to unroll the matrix. Which means a matrix ma uh, a matrix multiply turns from two terms, you know, a times b into nine terms. All a, a, a one b one plus a two b two plus you know, the whole bit, the whole bit, nine terms across. There's actually a common filter built into OpenCD. Oh, okay. So that's open source, um, and it's got its own matrix, you know, libraries built in. Yeah, I I tried using it, and it was. It was hard to understand how they did that. It wasn't well documented, but it's there. You're right. There's there. a lot, there's a paper on it. Yeah. Um, that I saw. It's a reasonable, reasonable description. Yeah, I tried to use somebody else's tutorial, and then, I, frankly, I would have been perfectly happy to go take somebody else's tutorial and stick it into my course. But I, it was they were all so bad that I ended up making my own. Experiment. That's why the subject is so so confusing sometimes. Yeah, because, I mean, if you would go back to our other little slide, I haven't seen anybody else. We go back to, let's go back to the, the graph. I'm the only person who's ever drawn that graph and said, this is what's real, this is what a common filter filters. And frankly, I started off my career as a, I was a SATCOM guy. I worked with satellites, and we did a lot of signals processing. So I'm used to thinking of filters. Band pass filters, high pass filters, low pass filters. So that's how you know I'm used to approaching signals that way, doing signals processing, and thinking. You know, first when you see a graph like that, I think signals processing. I'm going to make a band pass filter. Do you use a DSP for these, or do you? What, what sort of you could. I mean, honestly, why not? I mean, if what, what, what do you use? It's sort of embedded. Yeah. Sorry. What sort of hardware do you use for these? Uh, I've been using lecture two. Lecture two. Yeah. Yeah, arms. Uh, we use. I use for, in the race car. It's a gum stick. Uh, we've used beagle boards. We've used. Um, I've now got. Um, well, I, have, I have not finished getting my raspberry pies in, but I ordered some. So, but yes, the beagle boards and the gum sticks work pretty well. The one in yellow. The one in yellow. This one. That one. Yeah, no, that one. That one. I haven't seen anybody else come up with that graph and say this is what a common filter does. But that's what it does. I mean, that's it. It's taking that bottom part of that graph and it's throwing it away. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's the bullshit filter. <laughs> we can call this a man, we would normally call that a man pass filter or a notch filter. Except this is reflected around the zero, so it's really only one sided. Uh, this, this, the, drawing this graph as a two sided bit is kind of imaginary. It's actually only got one side. It's only got error. It's not error is absolute. It's not. There's not plus error or minus error. It's a Poisson. 
Yeah. So if you're, um, if you've got multiple yeah. sensors, <laughs> right, different kinds of sensors, and you're trying to fuse together. Mm -hmm. Um, what's the approach to that? You, you can do it two ways. Sensor, you or? can do it two ways. You can combine them all together into one big matrix, which is what most people do. Or you can have a different common filter for each one, which is actually a lot easier and a lot better. But it's a lot of math. So, um, like I said, it all depends on what you're doing. We were running, though frankly, we were running, as I said, this stuff on a, at 100 hertz on a gum stick, which is the smallest CPU you can imagine, and it was working fine. So you actually have, let me just, just in my mind, so I'm assuming, you say you use Python, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So we just and we did use a, 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 a Coleman some X, Excel, some Coleman Y, Coleman Z, and mm -hmm. comes out with the three values. Correct. And then loops Those around. become our new state estimate, that's what we use as a precision. Okay. And then we roll it in the next estimate around here, roll it around and use it again. So that, that comes to it's running Linux, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah, it's running Linux. That's yeah, a Cortex A8, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So we could handle it, the be and so could the Beagle board. I, like I said, I haven't tried. I haven't got a Raspberry Pi, so I can't talk to you about that. Have you run into problems with real-time latency with the Linux? Yes. <laughs> Can you describe those? <laughs> um, you have to quantify it, measure it, and deal with it. So uh, the trick was is that we used a real-time clock to uh, time tag all the samples at the time they were taken. And sometimes we had to, we knew we had to do a little, take a millisecond in or a millisecond out for delay. You're actually uh, writing these in drivers? They run in, in user space? Or they're, they're running no, in, they're running in user space. Yeah. Running in yeah, it's, I'm not, I've not had to do, I've had to do drivers a couple of times, but it's pretty, mostly for communication stuff. Um, but um, you use your real time clock, time tag it, and then we do this trick with the uh, coasting. So sometimes we have to coast stuff a millisecond here or there just to get them all in the same time frame because the problem is that if you're taking samples at different times is that the state of the vehicle has actually changed as you're moving along you know it's, it's not too bad in a slow moving robot in our 200 mile an hour race cars it was a bit more of a concern <laughs> so you, you don't assume that you have a regular sampling rate you, no. you time stamp no. everything we time stamp everything with the real time clock which in uh, the gum stick is uh, almost nanosecond accurate which is kind of So make sure that your uh, operating system gives you access to the real-time clock. So when there was, I think in, in Python, there's a, a SciPy, S-C-I-P-Y, Scientific Python, and it, that's one of the libraries in it is the real-time clock. When you're saying real-time clock, you're not talking about an RTC chip, you're talking about a timer. In talking about, you're reading the 5 megahertz clock that is the basis for timing for the, for the CPU. Yeah, so the system clock. The system clock, yeah. Okay. It's not the... Not regular the, user yeah. clock cycle clock. Yeah. It's a real. It's a fixed external real time clock. Okay. Right. Five just, days. just to because I'm simple here. You can obviously you can buy real time modules off mm -hmm. of eBay for about four bucks. Yep. That type of real time clock. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a few tricks that you can. No, those like the no. eBay one is the. The, the PC CMOS real time. Let me let me run on a coin cell battery. Give you uh, oh, okay. the seconds for the next yeah. ten oh, years. Oh yeah, that's, yeah. that's no, that's not what we're talking about. No, that's not what we're talking about. No, no. You mean a, a a high precision based on a hardware timer? Correct. Is that a thirty-two bit? An oscillator or something? Uh, like thirty-two bit mm -hmm. an integer value. So yes. Five megahertz it's gonna roll, rolling over yeah, for four yeah. seconds or something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, you can only use it to do delta times. You can't. It, it's not a absolute. Why don't you go to sixty-four bits? And yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why well, stop there? That's what we're doing on the project I'm on now. The guys that we're doing the clocks are really anal. Like, oh, we'll go to sixty-four bit timers. And there's some hardware that would let them, you know, gang two thirty-two bit timers. <laughs> and so now they got the sixty-four bit timer in the. The thing it's in is a medical device that you have to throw it away after eight hours. It's like no oh my anymore. goodness. So you never <laughs> get into that. We, can, we got a we got a timestamp for every twelve nanoseconds <laughs> the thing's in use. And so uh, it went a little over. Let's get into the second one to see if I got under too much than two. Have the matrix. Yeah, what yeah. the matrix? Looks, the state vector matrix looks like. Okay. Uh, so the secret to this is to get everything into the state vector matrix format. And use that as a common basis. Okay, so, so all trouble. the coasting and stuff. It's, it's, end of, it's the end of three. End, end of three. Yeah. 
I keep going. Let's see here. Coordinate system. I don't know if that doesn't help. Yeah, this is all just coordinate systems. So, okay. Well, the, the trick is is that to get everything into your state vector matrix, which for what I use is x, y, z. I mean, you can do it. There are two ways of doing it. You can use polar coordinates. You can use rectangular coordinates. Uh, and there's what certain advantages to using polar what coordinates. Mean polar? Uh, I don't. Know. Let's look in polar. I don't think so. What looks like? That's not even the spherical. Yeah. This is, uh, okay. Let's see. Nope. That one doesn't go into the state vector. No. Okay. Um, so basically, you can look at your vehicle. If you try to do it, admittedly, when you're trying to do it in in rectangular coordinates. You know, if it, particularly if you got a, a, a robot like yours, the, the, the balancing robot, or one that has a differential drive, it's naturally not in rectangular coordinates. It, it does everything in angles. So, um, uh, it, it, there's a, lots of things that I, you know, I generally will carry both a spherical representation and a polar representation of the state vector. Because some math is easier than others. Uh, lats and longs are spherical coordinates. Um, that you get out of the GPS. So if you're doing angles and distances and bearings, which you know a lot of the sensors give you just bear give you bearing information, so you you're converting all that back and forth to right. It's like what the about? size of a NASCAR yeah. course. You're essentially you flat square. <clears throat> I wouldn't imagine that that there'd be much curvature from one end to the other in terms of converting all that to, from polar to rect or from well, well, spherical to rectangle. I think it's called UMT. Why would you use that? That, there are advantages to UMT and there are reasons why, um, or UTM, you're thinking of UTM, Universal Transfer yeah, Mercator. Yeah, yeah. uh, the advantage to that, if you're an Army guy, yeah. is that you can do all your calculations in the local area as long as you're in the, the square of wherever that UTM is defined, everything is in meters. Yeah. So all your coordinates, you just subtract the two coordinates and you get the distance in meters. Right. It's really, really easy to use for that. It's, that's why artillery guys love it. All the trig is kind of it's all rectangle. It's all rectangles. Um, the problem is, is to figuring out, getting it down to figuring out which UTM square you're in is a fairly complicated process. Yeah, so. but, but but like a, like I said, once you knew what it was, like you were in a NASCAR, mm -hmm. you're not going to move the rest. Oh yeah, we can we can definitely use it for NASCAR. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Once we did the lat the. The, the trick we did with the NASCAR thing is that once we figured out where we were, we knew that the first nine, or let's say five digits of the GPS were never going to change because we're not going, we're not leaving the, <laughs> we're not leaving the track. You know, we're yeah. <laughs> so we threw away the first five digits and just carried in our position with just those last nine or ten digits of the GPS coordinates so that we had the significant digits. Uh, we had a real, you know, when I first started, they were had a real problem. They were kind of throwing away the significant digits and keeping all this crap up front, which was absolutely meaningless <laughs> in terms of, you know, where the vehicle was. Mm -hmm. It was all the same. Everybody, you knew, you know, the lat and the long degrees and minutes, yeah, down to the minutes, that's not going to change. So, anyway. All right, so uh, anyway, that's kind of the, the, the discussion in a nutshell. Um, I'll be happy to, if we've got other particular subjects that you guys want to talk about, we'll be happy to come in and give other bits. So. If you want to write down my email address, uh, it's fxgoveres, fxgoveres, Fox X-Ray Golf Oscar Victor Echo Romeo Sierra at yahoo.com. What's the X for? Xavier. Francis Xavier. <laughs> the third. What a great <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Uh, yeah, Catholic family. What can I say? F G O X F. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. F X G O V E R S at yahoo.com. Or on LinkedIn under under Francis Covers. And if it's something you think the whole group would like, you can just yeah, I'll post it. I get the DPRG. Francis, Francis, yeah, remember I'm on the, the DPRG, I'm on the DPRG mailing list. <laughs> I thank you guys very much for having me in and Sorry. listening to my, yes. let me practice my lecture. <laughs> well, thank you, Francis. Come back and practice again sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I, I got a bunch of other stuff, so yeah. Sweet. Yeah. 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 Yeah.